Hello, my name is Mariah Cunningham, and today I'm going to be talking to you about culture. Um, so I live in Cedar Hill, Missouri, which is about 30 minutes southwest of St. Louis. Um, I am an ESL teacher for kindergarten through fifth grade students. I'm the director of missions at Spring Hills Presbyterian Church, um, which is located in Burns Mill, Missouri. Um, and I'm also training in training right now to be an m &A ESL trainer. Um, my background, I went to Central Bible College and got a bachelor's um, in missions and Bible, which is considered other humanities. Um, I went to Missouri Baptist and got a master's in education. And most recently, I went to Southeast Missouri State and got a master's in teaching English as a second or other language. Um, I've been teaching um, ESL professionally for four years and um, also participated in um, starting the ESL program at our own church once our church realized that we had a very diver diverse community in uh, um, our area, then we decided that it would be a really good opportunity for us. So we started that last year, and on the first night we had 32 students show up, so that was very exciting. Um, and then we had to close down for COVID, but we're hoping to get started um, again really soon. I also am going to share a little information about my family. Um, I'm married to Jeff Cunningham. We've been married for 18 years. He is an elder at Spring Hills Church. Um, he is a communications tech by trade, and he attends Covenant Theological Seminary. We have four kids, Kai, who is 16 years old, Ashwin, is 12 years old, Piper is 11 years old, and Boston is 9 years old, soon to be 10. So we are a busy family. So the two main questions that we're going to look at um, are going to be what is culture and what is a culturation. So um, those are kind of the things that we're going to be thinking about today as we go through this presentation. I just wanted to share a couple of my slides with you. These are some of my students that um, show a diverse classroom. So the, the picture to the far left with all the boys sitting around the table, those are all currently second graders and they represent students from, um, whose families are from Mexico, Vietnam, Honduras, and China. So the first thing that we're going to look at is, let me move this down just a little bit, is going to be what we call the cultural iceberg. So this image just is a really good way for us to think about culture. So a lot of times when you ask people about culture or you ask them to um, name a um, characteristic of a culture, they're going to go with the surface culture, which is the items above the water, the top of the iceberg. So food, fest, um, festivals, fashion, the way people dress, holiday, um, uh, dances, even religion, music, um, all of those things that can be seen um, are going to be what we call surface culture. They're the things that we can point out really easily about someone else's culture. Um, and then when we look at the bottom of the iceberg, this is the part that's under the water. This is called deep culture. The things that we don't see necessarily about someone's culture, like communication styles and rules, what kind of gestures are appropriate, what kind of facial expressions um, are appropriate, body language, um, friendship, relationships between um, people, um, their ideas on government, their ideas on dating um, and marriage, um, attitudes towards education and how their children should be educated. Should they be involved? Should they not be involved? Um, their uh, outlook on death. Um, and then approaches to religion, which we already said, um, courtship, raising their children. Um, I can tell you that when I work with um, many different cultures, um, the way that they raise their children and have outlooks of um, education are all very different. Even um, 
families that have lived in the United States for a long time may still have a different outlook on this uh, aspect. So this iceberg is just a really good image for us to look at those things and realize what is the um, surface, what are things that we can see, and then what are the deeper things that we may have to research to understand, or as we build relationships with our students that we can ask them about and learn more about their culture. All right, we're gonna talk about acculturation. Um, acculturation is culture modification to an individual or a group of people by adapting or borrowing traits from another culture. So when you have someone move into the United States, um, they're bringing their culture and then they're looking at this new culture and they're trying to figure out how can they make this work together. And over time, they'll adapt um, uh, items from the new culture into the way that they live. And we call this acculturation when, you, when they start modifying their own culture to meet the needs that they have in their new culture. Um, so what does another aspect that we're going to look at is look at is culture shock. What does culture shock look like? So when some of our students first um, arrive, they may be going through the pre preliminary stages. Now, ESL students that you have in your classes could be in um, down this stage. They could be in like stage three or stage four, depending on how long they've used, lived in the United States. They may even be at the adaptation stage, which is near the end. So we're just going to talk about each of these stages briefly. So the preliminary stage is kind of like the before stage, the learning stage, when you're getting ready to go. Um, you study, you say goodbye to your friends, you find out about the culture, and then you leave. Um, the next stage is initial euphoria. This begins when you arrive in the new culture, and it ends when the novelty wears off. So a lot of times people can live off of an adrenaline rush of this new area and this new culture and everything that they're learning. Um, so they don't have fatigue and they don't have or they don't realize they're having fatigue or frustrations because they have that adrenaline that's keeping them going while they're learning um, all of this uh, new information. The next stage is irritability, and this is when you're coping with um, everyday aspects of life. So like maybe going to the bank or going grocery shopping, um, you realize that it is now more difficult for you. You um, may go to the bank and not realize the different things that you have to do when you're going to the bank there are different than what you are used to, and you kind of get frustrated with that. Um, so that is the third stage. And then the fourth stage is the gradual adjustment stage. Sorry, it's kind of hard for me to read what they have for the title there because it's in yellow. And this is when you become familiar with your surroundings. You've become oriented. You might not have the frustration that you had before, like when you're going to the bank or you're going to the grocery store. You now can do that with a little bit more ease. You understand the process. You understand how to catch the bus. Um, Life is becoming easier in your new culture. So then the adaptation stage. Adaptation, ad, adaptation stage is um, you now have learned how to fully function in the society and new culture. You have no problems getting around. You have no problems knowing how to go to the grocery store, how it all works. Um, you understand the different ways that the government works in the area that you're living. So you've adapted to your surroundings. And then so the last stage is the reentry phase. Now, not everyone will go through this because they don't always go back to their um, home culture. Um, but the reentry phase would be a time when someone then travels back home and then they realize that they have these new concepts and new ideologies from living in a different culture and they're trying to make those all work back together and the culture that they came from. And so sometimes that can be frustrating and can be a little bit stressful um, trying to transition back. All right, so we're going to um, talk about culture shock and our own experiences. So what I want you to do is I have a Venn diagram up here and it says yourself on it. If you do not have a Venn diagram, you can just take a piece of um, notebook paper and you can divide it into thirds. You can draw lines on it. 
whatever is easiest for you. And so this paper is divided into thirds, as you can see. And title one side of that with yourself. And here, what you're going to do is I want you to take time to think about a, um, a time when either you traveled overseas or into another area of our own country in the United States or into a new job where the culture was different than what you had experienced before. So maybe um, it is about traveling to another country. And you can think about those stages of culture shock and how you went through those stages, or um, even if it was like about jet lag or getting your money transferred over to um, the, the uh, monetary system that was in use. Or maybe it was starting a new job. When I started my new job four years ago, I had been teaching for eight years, but I had never been in this building. I had never worked with these teachers. It was a different culture. They ran things differently. So there was some culture shock that happened going into that um, building. So it might be just a different job um, or maybe a new church. So I just want you to think about a time that you were out of the ordinary of what you were used to and what that looked like for yourself. So what I would suggest at this time is that you um, pause the video and you take some time to um, write that out and then uh, restart it when you are ready. All right, if you um, are coming back from pausing the video and you've written a list of items there, um, what we're going to do next is I want you to look and think about culture shock in your classroom. So in your ESL classroom, I just want you to think about maybe one student or a group of students that maybe um, came, uh, that, that have the same type of culture. You might know some things about their background, you may not. And so now I want you to take that other, that piece of paper and on the other far side, write students in your classroom. And now I want you to think about the things that they are experiencing um, as they go through culture shock, as they go through acculturation. What may this look like in your classroom? How does it affect the way that they learn? What are um, some of the things that they may be experiencing through their jobs or going to the grocery store? So this is a time to think about what your students may be experiencing, or maybe you have had a um, foreign exchange student, and you can write um, from their experiences that they had. So again, I'm going to ask that if you um, are doing this, that you pause the video and write those things about your students. All right, if you have unpaused the video, now what I would like you to do is look at yourself and the students in your classroom. And I want you to see what are some of the similarities and in the middle just write some of those similarities down. Is there, are there similarities in um, the way you felt? Are there similarities in some of the problems that you had? Just again, this is a reflection piece just to help you Think about your students and think about things that you have gone through. If this was an in-person training, if we were doing this together, we would share some of those experiences with one another and um, how we felt when we were traveling or starting um, a new job. Some of the things our students have gone through and how we can empathize with our students and build relationships with them in these areas. All right, I'm gonna look at three areas of culture. So when we're looking at these three areas of culture, we have institutional culture, that's what is already there, it's already established. We have um, cultural histories, that's what the people bring with them. And then the culture we create. So that's what we bring from the other two areas and what the work we do um, together. So looking at institutional culture, again, this could be on a job. This could be what's already established in the new country and the new culture. There are certain things that are not going to change just because you're there now. Um, so some of those things are government. Um, that's a really, you know, can be a really hot topic, but where it's already established. So it's already there. And then cultural histories, what people bring with them. 
Um, if we think about some of our students that are refugees, they may be carrying baggage about um, government that is different than a different view than what we have had. We don't know what their experience has been, what kind of government they've come out of, um, if they lived in a refugee camp. Um, I'm just using government as an example. There are many other um, examples that can be used for institutional culture that is already established. Um, and then what we look at next is the culture we create. So by taking what was already established and their background and putting those things together, which is, falls under that acculturation, what, what kind of viewpoint do we have now? And how do we work together in having that viewpoint? Um, so it's really important for you to... Um, you know, understand some of the background that your students are coming from. If they are willing to share with you um, it, through conversation, then just try to talk to them about where they've come from, um, maybe about the culture that they came from, asking, you know, questions. If it seems like those questions are too personal and they don't want to answer them, don't push the topic. Um, and as you build relationships with them, they will open up to you. Um, the reason why this is important to know and to learn about your students is that they, you're building a relationship and you're building trust. And the more that they can have trust in you, the better that they're going to learn, the better students that they're going to be, and the better that you are going to be able to teach them and the better equipped you will be to meet their needs. Um, so that's the um, important part about building these relationships. Um, all right, so I want to share a case study with you um, just because this is a great example of how sometimes we think we know something, we think we have an idea of what something is about and what it's like, and then we realize we really have no idea. So the student, I'm going to talk about a female student who was 10 years old, and she is from um, the Muslim religion, and she spoke um, Somali. They speak Somali as their um, home language um, at home. Um, when she lived in Africa, they would travel between Kenya and Somalia. She was born in Somalia, but to her, her country was Kenya. And um, they lived in a refugee camp. Uh, they, she did not have any formal education when arriving to the United States. So when she got to the United States as an eight-year-old, she had never been in school, never been taught any formal education whatsoever. Um, and then when she got here, she went to the um, uh, a, an academy, an English-speaking academy called the Nahid Chapman New American Academy in St. Louis. And then when she came to me, um, she was placed in fifth grade. And she was 10 years old, and she had only been in school for two years. Her English was pretty good. She could communicate well, but her academics were really functioning at like a kindergarten, first grade level. So as you can see, being placed into a fifth grade classroom could be a little stressful when you're expected to write paragraphs and do math with fractions and decimals, and you cannot even write to 25 yet at this point. Um, so with all scaffolding as a teacher that, you know, that's my job is to help her be able to function in the classroom. But one thing that was really interesting, um, and I like to do this with my students, is to use um, Google Maps and um, look up where they lived. Um, and I've never had a student that was offended of, about this or that didn't like to share. Every time we've pulled this up, they get so excited. So I was looking through her file. I realized, you know, I knew she came from a refugee camp. I found the refugee camp. But in my brain, I was like, oh, I know what a refugee camp looks like. This is, you know, there's a couple buildings. They stay here for a little bit. They get taken care of and then they move on. Um, I could not have been probably more wrong than anything. Um, we pulled up her refugee camp. I'm going to change the slide over. And this was the first picture that came up. And when it came up, she was so excited. And she was like, that's my home. That's where I live. I live there. I live in that tent. 
And I just didn't realize that they lived in army issued, you know, military issued tents. And this was like her permanent home. This wasn't just like, oh, you stayed there for a couple of weeks and moved on. Like this was their permanent facility for many years. And as you can see, there's the, the fence around the um, refugee camp. And again, looking at this picture, I was like, oh, yeah, there's a couple of tents. And as we researched more into it, um, as you can, this is an aerial view. You can see that this place is huge. Um, I mean, they have schools, they have cinemas, they have like markets, um, and it basically runs as its own village or town, but inside this government controlled camp. And the next picture just shows another view from the side. Um, again, you can see thousands and thousands of facilities and tents and trailers that these families were living in. And this is just not how I had ever pictured what the refugee camp looked like. Um, I had a very fairy tale um, picture in my mind. Um, and then as she began to talk about this, she would tell us like at night, she would just sleep with her eyes shut really tight because um, there would just be gunshots all night long going on. Um, she never went to school because she said it was too dangerous to walk to school that men might come up and um, get you and rob you. And so legit reason for not going to school, they were really afraid that they would get killed on the way to school. So the reason why I bring this case study out is just because I want um, you to think about what we think we know, we don't always know. And so again, building relationships. Now, this is not something I would do on the first night and be like, hey, tell me about yourself. Let's Google map where you came from. But as you're getting to know your students, um, you could start first by finding out where they live and looking this up on your own. Um, and getting a perspective of where they lived, where they came from, um, what kind of housing that they lived in, the community that they lived in, just so that you have the background knowledge um, to better equip yourself when you're teaching. Um, another student I did this with, and he was from um, Puerto Rico, and he was very excited to show me, like walk me down the streets and show me where his grandma lived and the school that he went to. And he could say, oh, we went to that store. If you turn here, it'll take me to my house. And so we were able to actually locate his exact house. And in the Google Maps, his grandma was sitting on the front porch. So that was really fun. And he really loved showing us that. And We'd actually revisit that, even though it was the same pictures, he would want to revisit it sometimes and just look at it. Um, so he kind of felt a little bit at home there. Um, so I do suggest that you, you know, pull up Google Maps and take a tour of their village if you get the opportunity to do that, just to connect with them and build relationships. Um, so let's think about the social, um, emotional, uh, whoa. Sorry about that. Social emotional effects of our culture shock on our students. Um, so social emotional, the gradual um, integrative process in which the people acquire capacity, capacity to understand, experience, and express and manage um, emotions to develop meaningful relationships with others. So as you can see um, in this picture of the mind with decision making and empathy and self-esteem and commitment, um, that as they are, you know, learning and processing these things and minds are developing, they're going to have a set, this is already going to be set there for them from the culture that they're raised in. They're coming into a new culture. And so when they're going through these processes and their decision making seems compromised because decisions are made differently here than how they would make it. Their self-esteem may feel pretty low because they're not able to communicate as well. Um, your students may seem not motivated, like they're never going to learn this. Um, so these are just things to think about as they're going through culture shock, well, no matter where they are in that line, um, that it's affecting how they're going to be processing and building relationships. So this is just another aspect to think about with your students as you are building relationships and helping them adjust in the United States um, to cultural changes. 
So what can we do in our um, classrooms? Um, I have a couple tips. This is for building relationships with your students. This is not meant to take a lot of time. It's meant to be like icebreakers at the beginning, like a five minute um, icebreaker. Um, get to know you Pictionary using English cards, Google Translate, very simple phrases like what's your favorite animal, what's your favorite color. Um, students can draw their object, other students can guess it. Um, get to know you charades, same concept. They draw, like you pick a topic, what's your favorite animal? They draw it, and then they're act, or they're acting it out, and other people are trying to guess what their favorite animal is. Um, if students do not want to participate at first, do not make them. Over time, as they build in trust and build relationships with the other students, um, they will definitely start joining in on these activities. Um, label your room. If you have a classroom that you use, um, like at our church, our ESL rooms are in the Sunday school classrooms. Um, you can label your room with English words like clock with a picture, door with a picture of a door, um, just to help build the vocabulary there. Um, also have clear routines and expectations. Um, I find it very helpful to run the classroom, um, the activities the same, like you're going to do opening, you do your Bible study, you do your lesson, you take a break, um, you do the second part of your lesson, and then have closing. When you follow the routine, then they get more comfortable with what is expected of them during the class. Um, also, the expectations that you have in your class that you would like for them to do their homework. Um, of course, we all know that there, you know, there might be exceptions depending on what's happening in students' lives. Um, I also suggest that you use photos or pictures as often as possible with um, your vocabulary or when you are telling them a story or relating to them, um, using pictures of your family, um, doing different items, then they feel connected to you also. I keep my four kids pictures in my classroom. So anytime I'm talking to my students and relating to them, I can say, you know, this son did this. And then they'll say, oh, which one is that? And show the picture just so that they can see those connections. Or um, a couple of weeks ago, I was doing a, um, a reading passage on swimming. And uh, so I pulled up my kids um, they're on the swim team. I pulled up some pictures of them getting ready to dive into the water and um, during their race. And so the kids were really excited to see that because a lot of them had no idea what happens at a swim meet. Um, so then they're able to put those visuals with what they were reading. So just using photos and pictures also to um, support your teaching. So I hope that the talk on culture just helps you stop and reflect about yourself and about your students and how you can um, support your students in your classroom that may be going through culture shock or that are um, trying to fit into the new culture that they've come to. Um, you know, we also suggest that, you know, pray for your students, pray for the situations that they're going through, pray that they attend your classes, and, um, you know, just continue to build those relationships with that, with them. So I hope that that was helpful. And I hope that you all can um, take some of these strategies and build relationships with your students.